So when we talk about the decline of cinema, we don't mean that the movies are about to disappear. What we mean instead is that the movies as a cultural institution have ceased to be the Central American art form. I'm Ross Douthit, your host for the Film and Culture series at the Athenaeum Center for Thought and Culture. People have been talking about the decline of the movies for a very long time. If you go back to the dawn of television in the 1950s, you see sort of the first real rival to the motion picture industry emerging. And from that point on, Hollywood is always sort of looking back to some golden age, always sort of looking backward to a vanished past when the movies were somehow more essential than they are today. But even with that constant nostalgia, that constant backward glance, in reality, television doesn't knock the movies off their pedestal. It steals some of the movie's audience. Nobody in the 1960s goes to the movies at the same pace and rate that Americans went to the movies in the 1940s. But you still have this sense that television is this vast wasteland of sort of second rate and mediocre content. And if you're trying to be a big star, if you're trying to command the largest possible audience and trying to sort of drive and shape the American conversation, you're going to do it at the movies. So if you're an actor and you become a big star in a TV show, you always want to test yourself by making the leap to the big screen. And sometimes you're Bruce Willis and that leap works. And sometimes you're Shelley Long or David Caruso and the leap is unsuccessful. And from that point on, you're always known as the TV star who couldn't make it in the movies. And the same is true for directors. You get directors who start out making TV shows, directing episodes of television. Steven Spielberg got his start this way, Robert Altman, others. But the leap is always to making movies on the biggest possible screen for the biggest possible audience. And that pattern continues really down to the turn of the 21st century. So you get to the late 1990s, and you know it's an era when obviously television is an incredibly important mass art form, and you start to have the idea of the TV auteur coming into existence. You know you have shows like The X Files that sort of pioneer a kind of obsessively watched serial television. But even in that era, for instance, ratings for the Academy Awards still go up across the 1990s. And what you still have in that era is the same thing that you had at the beginning of Hollywood in the 1940s and 1950s, a set of stars, actors and directors who sort of bestride the cultural landscape, a set of familiar genres, romance, historical epic, the Western, comedy, broad and highbrow, and many others that are sort of constantly being reworked and refashioned, but are still sort of setting a cultural tone for honestly, how Americans think about themselves, right? Um, that's, that's sort of the old landscape. That's the landscape where when we talk about the movies, capital T, capital M, that's the landscape we have in mind. It's a landscape, if you look at sort of best picture nominees from the 1990s, where there's a kind of norm of a high middle brow original or semi-original or at the very least sort of refashioned story for adults that can command a very large audience. And even though, you know, by that point you have home video, you have, you know, sort of VCRs and so on, everyone understands that the movies are primary and the home market is secondary. A movie like The Shawshank Redemption or Austin Powers can find a bigger audience on home video than it ever did in theaters. But nobody wants to start out as a home video star or as a direct-to-video star. You're always starting in the, with the cinematic experience first. So if you take, you know, periods like the early 1990s, you'll get a year where the Best Picture nominees include Braveheart, Sense and Sensibility, Babe, and Apollo 13. Sorry, it took, it took me just a second, right? So that's, that's and Il Postino, um, a, foreign, a foreign language film, is sort of the fifth nominee that year. But if you just take the four American movies, you can see sort of the range, the range, you know, you sort of, you have a historical romantic 
romantic drama comedy in the Jane Austen adaptation. You have a historical epic in Braveheart. You have a sort of sophisticated kids movie in Babe. And then you have in Apollo 13, a, a drama of sort of the American experience starring Tom Hanks, who the sort of classic all American movie star in the mode of Jimmy Stewart. And that's a characteristic year for you know what gets what both what gets nominated for an academy award and also what commands a large audience and you get to the late 1990s you can have you know a year when the best picture nom when the best picture battle is between shakespeare in love and saving private ryan like two radically different hollywood genres radically different archetypes radically different kinds of stories that are both characteristic of the hollywood dream factory and both showcasing young and older stars and both commanding large audiences. Or you get sort of the, the people's choice of Titanic against the higher brow choice of LA Confidential, but they're both movies made for the largest possible audience. They're both launching pads for, you know, Russell Crowe, Leonardo DiCaprio, Kate Winslet, actors who are sort of destined to become movie stars in the old sense of the term. So that's the former world. And that world, again, survives television, survives the VCR, but it doesn't survive the rise of the internet and the trends in sort of distribution, production, and commerce around the movies in the last 20 years. So what changes? What happened to that world? Well, a few different things happened. 